many of you believe we serve a God of miracles? Come on, everybody. Amen. Come on, I welcome you to stand to all of our campuses. Are you having a good morning? It got cold again. Isn't that good? So everybody comes in this morning with scarfs on and everything. I mean, it's not that cold, y'all. But you got to break it out the closet when you can. Hey, speaking of break it out, break that outline out right now. I want us to read uh, from the book of Hebrews. Today I'm going to speak to you on the subject of faith fundamentals. Faith fundamentals. Say faith, 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 faith. Say, God, help me have faith. We need faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. In verse 6, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Man, I just want to start preaching right now, but I'm going to keep reading. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Verse 6 is so good. Let's read it again. Let's read it all together in unison, everybody. Let's read. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. What a great verse. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your presence in this place. You are the God of miracles. We want you to know, Father, that we believe in you. We declare our faith in you. God, thank you that at every campus right now, your presence is with us. God, thank you for the people of God who love one another and who love you with all of our hearts. God, we dedicate this day to you. We dedicate this time to you. Encourage us, lift us, change us in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 God bless you. You can be seated. Well, it's turkey week, everybody. I mean, you ready to try out a new recipe or eat so much? Y'all ready to gain two or three pounds? See, at the beginning of the year, we have fasting, but we're in the season of feasting right now. No, we're going to have a great week. Say faith, 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 faith. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of your faith. Faith is probably one of the most important words in Christianity. Faith. The belief in something that's unseen. You've never seen Jesus with your own eyes, but yet you believe in him. You've never seen God with your own eyes, but yet you believe in him. You've never been to heaven, but you believe it's there. You've never been on the other side of death, but yet you believe that there is life on the other side. This is called faith. Faith is being convinced. It's easy to be convinced about something that you see. You're convinced that there's somebody sitting next to you, right? You're convinced because you see it. But Jesus said, blessed is he who hasn't seen, but yet believes. Are you a person of faith? Do you believe even though you haven't seen? Thomas was a person that said, no, I will not believe in the resurrected Christ unless I put my hand into his side and feel the wound. And Jesus showed up and had heard every word he said. And he said, right here, Thomas, feel where the spear went in. Put your hands right, put your fingers in my palms. And, and, and Thomas felt so bad because he hadn't believed. And Jesus said, you believe because you've seen. But blessed is he who hasn't seen but yet believes. I want to inspire you this morning to be a person of faith. Because faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. In this verse we just read, it says that faith gains us a good spiritual reputation. It says the people in the days of old were known by their faith. So what do we mean by that, reputation? In the natural world, you have a reputation. You know, maybe people know you that you've always had integrity. You've always been honest. You've never gossiped or slandered. Maybe uh, you're known as somebody who doesn't pay their bills on time. Maybe you're known as somebody that doesn't show up on time. Or maybe you're known as a player. You know, whatever your reputation is, in this earth, we build a reputation through years. In eternity, we don't build our reputation based on our actions. We build our reputation based upon our faith. 
Your spiritual reputation is based upon the amount of faith that you have. A lot of faith, a great reputation in front of God. Little faith, no reputation in the spirit world. There's a passage in the Bible, in the book of Acts, where these guys had seen Paul cast demons out of somebody, and they were seven Jewish brothers called the sons of Sceva. And they wanted to cast out devils just like Paul had cast out devils. And so there was a person that was possessed by demons, and they went over and they said, in the, uh, we cast you out in the name of Jesus and in the name of Paul. And this demon screamed out of them and said, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? And that demon inside that one man beat up all seven of those guys and stripped their clothes off and they ran out of the house naked. You can read about it in the Bible. <laughs> because they had no spiritual reputation. What is your spiritual reputation? Your spiritual reputation is based on how much you believe. And that's why the enemy is after your faith so much. He wants to destroy your faith and our culture wants to destroy your faith. Everything in this world is trying to pull your faith away. But God is so pleased with a person of faith that hasn't seen but yet believes. And everything in this world is pulling at your faith to pull it down. But you got to stay strong in your faith. Faith gains us a good spiritual reputation. Another thought about faith is it is the only way that we can receive spiritual things. If you don't have faith, you can receive nothing from God. You can't receive a word from God. You can't receive a healing from God. You can't, you can't move in the gifts of the spirit unless you activate them by faith. Everything done in the spirit world is done by faith. And so if you want to receive something from God, you have to have faith. When Jesus was on the planet, he would walk around everywhere and someone say, will you heal me? And, and Jesus would heal him, but he said, let it be done according to your faith. Oftentimes he would rebuke his disciples because they weren't able to do miracles like he could. And they said, why can't we do miracles? And he says, it's because of the littleness of your faith. He said, you have no faith. So without faith, we can't receive anything from God. You see now why the enemy wants to attack your faith? Where you can't believe stuff? You can't believe in God? And, and because of that, you don't receive things from God. Faith is how we move in our spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians, it talks about our spiritual gifts. In Romans, it talks about our spiritual gifts. But it says that they're all mobilized by faith. The gift of prophecy, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, gift of faith, working of miracles, discernment of spirit, gifts of prophecy, uh, interpretation of tongues. All of that happens according to our faith. So this is how we receive things from the spirit. Look at this, faith is the only way that we can please God. When I was in school, there was always the, the teacher's pet, the person who schmoozed up to the teacher more than anybody else. Did, do you know somebody like that, or were you that person? You realize it's your way to get an A. Y'all heard my story about Miss Humphreys, huh? Y'all want to hear the story about Miss Humphreys? So Miss Humphreys was a history teacher. And she was, she was a sweet, sweet elderly lady that had come out of retirement to teach. And she was a little bit scattered in her, her processes of teaching. Uh, but she would get so frustrated because everybody would talk in her class. And she'd say, yo, stop talking in my class. You know, she would, she would always, and I was the one that she was always having to correct. I was, I was not the teacher's pet. I was the, the opposite of the teacher's pet. And... But Miss Humphreys was always a sucker for a good encouragement and some, some affirmation. So if I got a bad grade on a test, I'd always go up to Miss Humphreys and say, Miss Humphreys, you look so beautiful today. <laughs> and she would say, you don't mean it. I'd say, I do mean it, Miss Humphreys. You look amazing. <laughs> and I was able to gain a good reputation. Because but there would be times where she would give a test and she'd say, I'm, I'm giving y'all a pop quiz today because you never listened to me. And I, I didn't know any of the answers on the whole test. So I, I brought my test up to Miss Humphreys and I'd say, Miss Humphreys, what's this, this question? Question number one. I, I don't really understand the question. And she would say, well, read it. And I, I'd read it and I'd say, I just don't really understand. I said, I, I wish I had a way of of knowing the answer to that question. <laughs> and Miss Humphreys, she'd look up at me, she had those glasses, she'd say, well, I'll just give you this one. 
and she'd give me that one. Then I'd go back to my desk and I'd look at number two and I didn't know number two. So I'd go up to Miss Humphreys, you look so beautiful today. And she'd say, you don't know number two, do you? So then, then I'd fill out number two and I would make a 100 on the test by just schmoozing up. So I love Miss Humphreys. Miss Humphreys is in heaven now. One day I'm gonna go up there and thank her. She got me through school. That's why I'm so smart, y'all. But, you know, somebody that gets up close to the teacher uh, is, is called the teacher's pet. If you want to be somebody close to God that gets a ton of favor from God and, and close to God, faith is the way you do it. Schmoozing got me close to Miss Humphreys. Faith gets you close to God. You want to be right up next to God and get the favor of God, you got to believe. You look at a guy like Job, who Job, everything that he believed was taken from him. He believed that God was going to protect his family. Well, he lost his family. He believed God was going to take his health, and uh, he believed that God was going to protect his health, and, and his health was taken away from him. Everything he believed was taken out from under him, but he refused to curse God. His wife said, curse God and die. He said, I will not. And then he said this statement. He said, I know my Redeemer lives. And if you read the book of, uh, the end of the book of Job, God multiplied everything back to Job because he withstood the test of faith. Faith impresses God. In the book of Hebrews, right where we just read, there's two things that it says you must believe. You first, you must believe that God exists and you must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so, man, if, if, if you're struggling to say, does, does God exist? You're never going to please God in a state where you don't believe in him. And then it says that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. See, I believe in a God who rewards those that come after him, that pursue him, that desire to know him. He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So the first 10 chapters in Hebrews is this writer convincing Jewish people, as we talked about last week, that Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than Aaron. Jesus is better than sacrifices. He's better than angels. But now you get into chapter 11 and he says, so what is your responsibility? All you have to do is believe. Believe. And don't let anything take away your faith. And so he starts, and, and it seems to be chronological, and it is chronological, but I want to unpack five faith fundamentals that are right from the passages in the beginning of Hebrews. Five faith fundamentals that you must believe and never let go of. The first one we find in verse three. It says, by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed. This thing did not evolve. There was no big bang that, that sent stars and planets and galaxies into, into eons of time and space. And then all of a sudden from that, all that craziness developed this genius planet with people that have DNA that's so intricate. I mean, we believe that the universe was formed. Somebody intentionally designed this place at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. So the first faith, the cornerstone of faith is faith in creation. You have to believe, and the Bible begins, Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You have to be a creationist if you want to please God. You have to believe that God created this thing. And the world would say, you, you really believe that, you know, Genesis, it says that God formed the day and the night, and then he, you really believe that stuff? My question is, you really believe that, that something like from nothing exploded into a universe? So, anybody ever seen this picture right here? This is uh, Mount Rushmore. Anybody ever seen that? South Dakota? You know, this proves that over billions of years, if time erodes every, uh, if wind blows just right and the weather is just right, that it can form the face of human beings out of rock. <laughs> All you have to do is look at that and know somebody had to have done that. Somebody had to do that because nowhere else are their faces in rock. But if we'll know for sure that somebody did that, how much more the real thing? Like I'm moving and living and breathing. 
Mount Rushmore. Oh, just, just time did that. No way. God created man. If you look at the DNA code, DNA is a language. Every language has a writer. DNA is a, is, a, is a language, and in every cell of your body is your entire genetic code. If you were to take the genetic code of your body in one cell and wrap it out, it would go from, from here to the sun and back over eight times. Okay? Look at, look at this Bible that I have here. This is made of the English language. Nobody would be crazy enough to believe that this book evolved over millions of years and all of these words, English was created by evolution. And then all these letters fell together in just the right place and we'll believe that the simplicity of the English language was made by a person, but you look at the DNA language and you say that that just happened? Come on, everybody. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And man, the devil wants to keep people so ignorant and confused and blinded in their hearts. It really doesn't take a ton of faith to believe in creation. But that is the first foundational piece of, of faith. And listen to this, that all faith produces action in our life. All faith produces something in our life. So if you truly believe it produces, let me give you, a, give you an example. If a car is coming at you at 50 miles an hour and you believe that it's gonna hit you, are you gonna stand there or will that faith produce action? True faith always produces action, <laughs> okay? So when you believe in creation, you really believe in creation, what does it produce in your life? It produces humility. Because you realize you did not create you. You did not think you up. You know, I like to ask people the question, do you remember before you were born? Of course not. Do you remember thinking, I should make myself. I should be. And wow, I'm here. No. You grew in your understanding that I'm here. And somebody had to put me here. This creates a, a humility in us that makes us realize that we do not exist for our own pleasure, for our own glory, for our own satisfaction. There's only one reason we exist, is for the pleasure of the one who created us. Even though we are brilliant, we are smart, we are created beings. We exist for his glory. That, that means that anything that he created you to be that you rebel against and try to be something else, you're in rebellion against your creator. This is with gender confusion that's going on. God created male and female. And if the creator fashions you a certain way and made you a certain way, he made everything about you intentionally. He made your gender in intentionally. He gave, he gave you to the family that he gave you to intentionally. And so what, who is the creation to say to the creator, nah, I, th I think you made a mistake here. I'm going to do what I feel like I should do. No, you're a creation. Can I preach truth to you? You need, to say, you need to say to your creator, thank you for wanting me around. Thank you for deciding to make me because I think it's pretty cool to exist. And so how can I please you, creator? How can I live to glorify you? I'm going to be the, you made me a man, I'm going to be the best man I can be. I'm going to live for your glory the best way I possibly can. So faith in creation produces humility. Then the second foundation of faith is found in verse four. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. This is faith in the cross. Faith in the cross. There's two guys, one guy was Cain, one guy was Abel, and God desired sacrifice for both of them. One guy brought the very best of his product, his fruit, and then another guy believed God, that God said only blood can cleanse and, and redeem, and so Abel obeyed God and brought a sacrifice that God ordained, and so that pleased God. This is faith in the cross of Jesus Christ to save us, to make us righteous. 
And I preached on it last week, but we only have one chance at heaven, one chance at redemption, and that's the cross of Christ. And it is so simple. You got two boards, one this way and one this way with the Son of God hanging on it, and that is the centerpiece of humanity right there. And if you put your faith in the cross of Jesus Christ and what was accomplished on that, then that faith pleases God. Faith outside of the cross produces no righteousness in our lives. We have to have the cross. Here's a couple of facts that I believe. I believe that the cross was a true historical event. I don't believe that it's figurative. I don't believe it's illustrative. I believe it was a true historical event that Jesus of Nazareth hung on a cross. And I believe he was God in the flesh and that he took on his shoulders the sins of the entire world. And that God judged him and all that are in Jesus Christ can be forgiven because he took the smack of God's blow. I believe that the cross is the centerpiece of human history. That's why we divide time in B.C. and A.D., before Christ and after Christ. That's, that's what we, div- we divide time by this man, Jesus Christ, and it all comes down to this simple symbol of the cross. It is the centerpiece of humanity. Think about how the genius of God, that the centerpiece or the center symbol of humanity is a vertical piece and a horizontal piece with God on it. It's God wanting to be with man. Thy will be done on heaven as it is on earth, where that thing collides. This is the centerpiece of human history. I also believe that without the cross, humanity would be lost. So there's seven, over seven billion people on the planet right now, and I feel like if there was no Jesus and no cross, that every single one of us would be forever separated from God. There would be no choice, no chance at redemption because all have sinned and fallen short. But because of the cross of Jesus Christ, all humanity can be saved. That's God's plan. I also believe that without the cross, I would be totally lost. I don't want to know where I would be without the cross of Jesus Christ. If his cross, if he hadn't have died on the cross, we would have not been here today. I would not be here today. I don't know where I'd be. I might be a, a drunk on the street somewhere, just miserable and wanting to end my life. But because Jesus died on the cross, I am here. I am happy. I am whole. I have a family that's blessed. And I'm telling you, my life is blessed because of the cross of Jesus Christ. So I believe in what happened on that cross. So if... If belief in creation produces humility, what does belief in the cross produce? It produces gratitude, overwhelming sense of gratitude. When you look at the cross of Christ, it just produces this sense of like, thank you. And, you know, you'll never be able to repay Jesus. You'll never, like, you're so in debt to him, you'll never be able to repay him. All you can do is just say, thank you but live in a way where that gratitude is seen in your life. Like give so generously, live so generously, live with gratitude. But that's why when you worship, you shouldn't softly worship. I believe you should loudly and exuberantly worship God because you have so much to be thankful for. I mean, you should explode in worship. That's that's what I believe. I mean, when it comes time to worship God, I'm like, hey! Thank you. (laughs) You know? So it produces gratitude. The third third foundation of faith is found in verse 5. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him, for before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. The third fundamental of faith is, is faith in heaven. We see Enoch, who enjoyed a close walk with God, but then was not because God took him. You know, yesterday I was praying for our services this weekend, and I like to walk and study and walk and pray. The reason why is because if I sit and study, a lot of times my ADD kicks in and I just can't focus. And so when I walk, my body's doing something and my mind can actually focus. And uh, so I was, I was walking and praying uh, yesterday, and I was just meditating on the beauty of heaven. And one day that we're all going to be there. And one year ago, uh, tomorrow, my wife and I put one of our sons in heaven. And uh, it was exactly a year ago. And tomorrow, I'm releasing a song that I wrote during that moment that was so tough. I almost played it for you today, but you wouldn't have been able to handle it. I'm just telling you. 
you have to watch it tomorrow. But anybody who's ever lost somebody, anybody who's ever lost a child or a father or mother or a sibling or somebody, you know what? We didn't lose them forever. We know where they are. And our hope is in heaven. And, and here's Enoch. He was walking with God day and night. And one day the Bible says that he disappeared for God took him. This is our faith in eternity. It's our faith in heaven. And I want to build your faith that this world is not our final home. We are going to another place. And uh, when I think about all the people who are in heaven, I was thinking about my, my granddad, Jim Clark, yesterday, and, uh, and what a blessing he was to my life. And he's there in heaven right now. And so I am convinced of the reality of heaven. I am so convinced. I'm as, I'm as convinced about the reality of heaven as I am that you're sitting in this room or, or anything else. I'm convinced of heaven. I'm convinced that I'm, I'm headed there, and everybody that has Jesus in their heart is headed there. This is what I'm talking about, faith. And you know it's faith, listen to me, you know it's faith when people from the world can say he's crazy. Because the stronger you declare your faith, the easier it is to say, he's crazy. But this is my faith. I believe this. I believe in, in heaven. I believe just as Enoch did and was taken up to heaven, to be with God. You got to be firmly convinced in heaven, the reality of heaven. And when you believe in heaven, what kind of action does it produce in your life? It produces the action of hope. It also produces an action of being detached from earthly things. Like earthly things have no value to me. Every rich person I've ever seen, when they die, they leave everything behind, everything. So thank God for taking care of our needs, but that's not where the true gold is. Because I believe in heaven, I, I, I don't have any attachment to earthly things. This is what it produces in our life. Amen? Amen. I want to read you two scriptures to just encourage you. John chapter 14, verse 2. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. This is a fact. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. That is what the scripture means when they, when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared, 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 prepared. God has prepared for us, everybody. He's prepared it right now for those who love him. So this is a conviction in heaven. The fourth is seen in the next verse, Hebrews uh, 11 verse 7. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat. Man, they thought he was crazy. He's building a boat and it had never rained before. Guys, before this moment, there had never been a, a, a rain like this and God told him to build a boat so he started to build a boat. You know who that boat is? That boat is Jesus. This is all symbolic of who Jesus is and he began to put his trust in Jesus Christ and he put it in it to save his family from the flood he obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. Yeah. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. This fourth foundation, fundamental of faith, is faith in judgment. You can't just believe in God's grace and incredible mercy and love through Christ Jesus and not also believe that he is the fair judge of all the earth. God is not schizophrenic. God is not going to change his mind. He's not going to get to judgment day and everybody show up. You have murderers that have never been condemned. You have uh, people that have kidnapped and raped and, and done all kinds of things. They're not going to show up on judgment day and God's going to say, you know what? All you guys just come on in. I just, just come on. He's not going to do that. He would not be the just judge of all the earth. Thank God that we have a just judge that is sitting at the throne of all the universe. And one day, everybody's gonna get what's coming to them. Everybody. And you don't have to believe to get your judgment. One day, you're not gonna have to have faith. You're gonna see him. I just hope it's not too late. And when you see him, he will be the judge. Now, guys... Just like there was a little ark that saved people, there is a little door, and that little door into heaven is called Jesus. It's that cross that I was talking about. You can 
you have access to the love of God through Jesus Christ. Outside of that door to the love of God is only the wrath of God because the wrath of God is poured out against all sin. Guys, God fashioned this universe. He made it. He he designed human beings. But one day he's going to destroy the whole thing and he can because he made it. And there's only one safe place of refuge, and that's in Jesus Christ. You say, well, why why Jesus Christ? Because Jesus is the leader of a tribe. And Jesus was completely innocent, but he got smacked with the full wrath of God's judgment, and he was completely innocent. But if you will allow him to be your representative, and you will come under his tribe and allow him to be the one that takes God's wrath for you, then there is no more wrath for you because it's already been poured out on Christ Jesus. But if you're not in his tribe and he is not your sacrifice, then you're out here. You're not in the ark. You're by yourself. But see, as a believer, you can't just have faith in God the Santa Claus and God the the gooey gooey, he loves you gooey. He's, Romans 11 says, notice how God is both kind and severe. Hebrews chapter 12, it says, our God is a consuming fire, so let us worship him with reverence and fear. So, what what action does this faith in judgment produce? It produces the fear of God, where you don't want to be judged by God. Hey, did anybody grow up in a family where spankings were still around, still happen? I hope you're passing that down to your kids. Seriously, quick sermon break. This is not a parenting sermon, but spankings still work. Timeouts, nah. You always can spot some timeout families. Their kids are in restaurants throwing macaroni everywhere and screaming, and they're like, and they're looking at each other. Well, I don't know what to do. I, what do you? He said, hmm. "I'll tell you what to do." <laughs> I have people. I have people. I have people tell me, "Look, spankings don't work for my kids. They just they don't work. That's because you're doing something wrong. <laughs> there is something wrong about the application." That little paint stick that keeps breaking just ain't cutting it. You're going to have to up your game a little bit. But anyway, so I, I came up in a good southern home, and, 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 you know, it was six of us. My parents had to believe in spankings, you know? <laughs> and uh, one day I was sitting in a service very similar to the one you're sitting in, and I was on the front row. And my dad was preaching, and it was my older brother, Joel, and uh, a a girl that we were adopting, we were in the process of adopting from Nigeria, her name was Sharon, and myself. And Sharon didn't know a lot of English, Uh, she was still learning English, and somebody hit somebody, and I don't remember what happened, but it turned into a little fight, so we're like, hey, just, you know, we were starting to get at it, and then it got louder and louder, and we had forgot where we were, and we were all into this, this little fight we were having, and my dad was preaching, and he did just like this, Will everybody excuse me for a moment while I turn and correct my kids? And those, those, those words were like, <laughs> i never forget hearing them. And my dad ripped around and, and he said, Joel, I want you to sit on the end. Jonathan, you come all the way to this end. And Sharon, you stay right there. And uh, we were all, you know, you think I heard a word he said the rest of the sermon? No. I had fearful expectation of wrath. I just knew that at the end of that message, it was going to go down, and I was right. I'll never forget it, and you know, that day I learned how to act in church. I, 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 I picked it up. But God is not different than that. God is a discipline. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that he disciplines those that he loves, We've been reading all through the, the prophets, and uh, hey, I just, for my own curiosity at every campus, you know, this year we've been reading through the Bible. We're 11 and a half months in, and I know that's a long time to read your Bible every day. Some of you probably made it two months, some of you made it six months, but I just got to know, how many of you 11 and a half months in are still hanging on like a hair in a biscuit? Wave at me. Yeah, baby, that's what I'm talking about. 
you, you read it. But we're at, right now, we're reading, uh, those of you guys that didn't raise your hand, get back in it. You got another month and a half. Thanksgiving week's a good time to plug in. But so we're in Ezekiel, and every chapter, it's like, say to Ammon, you're about to be destroyed. I'm going to tear down, te- say to Moab, I'm going to kill everybody there. Tell, and you read it, and you're like, God, he is a God of justice. He is a God of judgment. And you cannot just believe in God, Santa Claus. I worship God, the Santa Claus. No, he's very loving, but his love is revealed through Christ. And outside of Christ, there is no love. Christ is his outlet of love to humanity. You're in Christ, you get love. Outside of that is judgment, okay? You got to believe in judgment. The fifth thing, the, the, the final foundation stone of faith is found in verse eight. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. This is faith and direction. Faith that God actually cares about my next step. Faith that God cares about what I do with my life. If God cared enough to make me fearfully and wonderfully, don't you think he has a plan for me and there's a direction that he wants me to take? I believe in the, in, in that God directs the steps of the righteous. Look at Psalm 37. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He directs the steps of the godly. That doesn't mean like how you walk. It means, it means your decisions, that you don't make dumb decisions. God wants to direct the steps of the godly so you make the right decisions and you accomplish the purpose that he put you on this planet for. God wants to direct your steps. Let's keep reading that. He delights in every detail of their lives. This is theology right here. This is that God actually cares about the details of your life. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 11. I will teach you wisdom way, wisdom's ways and lead you in straight paths. I believe that God wants to direct our paths. And Abraham... The Bible says that God called him and said, Abraham. He said, leave everything. And Abraham had this this knowing that he was to leave where he was. And man, he took a step of faith and everybody said he was crazy. I don't know if, if you've ever been in a situation where you made a bold move, like you moved your family somewhere or you changed jobs and everybody was like, man, you are crazy. But that was a step of faith, okay? There's a difference between just leaning on your own understanding, but then also hearing the direction of God for your life and taking a big step of faith like Peter. Peter heard Jesus say, step out on the water, and he did, and that water was solid. And I believe that there is a level you can graduate to with God where you really can identify his voice clearly And you can take steps of faith that feel crazy, but God is in it. And and boy, it's the most exciting thing to do, to live by faith. When God says, move, you move. And what I've learned with God is he never paints the full picture. He never says, move here, and this will happen, and this is going to happen, and everything's going to be okay. It's always move. But, 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 you know... And God lets you take that first step, then he reveals the next step. And can I just, um, I feel prompted to tell you this this weekend. God does not speak to you how I speak to you. I use English, which is a very low form of communication. God lives inside of your spirit. And he directs your heart. He directs your thoughts. And as you grow in him, that's why it's important to know his word and to pray and to know his spirit because you will identify when God is leading you into a place. And when God is leading you, it's like a, it's like a sound that gets louder and louder and louder that does not go away. And, and this thing, it becomes overwhelming where God, and, and for Abraham, I'm sure it was, 
this overwhelming sense of leave, 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 and I will show you leave. And he told his wife, babe, we got to go. And she's like, this is crazy. But he knew in his heart God was leading them. And I want to ask you, what is God leading you to step out and do? And man, you may waste your whole life in disobedience because you're scared to step out when he's directing you. But man, you'll never know the fullness of his purpose for your life until you have the courage to step out with his leading. And of course, I believe in wisdom. I believe that you want counsel around you, godly counsel. I believe that everything, every move has to be rooted in the word of God. But man, when you identify the voice of God leading your life, know that the Lord step, uh, ordains the steps of the righteous. Amen? Amen? I pray that all the time for my life. God, please, I don't want to take Jonathan's steps. I don't want to follow my own desires and directions. Lead my heart. Lead my mind. Let me take steps that are ordained by God. And you know what? Every step that he's led me into, even though it seemed crazy when I was making it, every step is right in tune with his purpose and plan. Amen? So I want to challenge you to be confident in his direction in your life. And the action that it produces, uh, or the, what it does produce in your life is action. You will step out. When you believe in his direction, you will produce action. Amen? Yeah. So I felt like there are going to be people here at all of our campuses that need prayer for their faith. And I want to return back to that thought on faith is what gains you a good reputation. You have no reputation in heaven because your faith is so weak. And you... Oftentimes, people that are super intellectual have problems with faith because faith is a spiritual thing, and they instantly go to their mind. You may have a great earthly reputation because of your mind, but you have a horrible spiritual reputation because you have no faith. And I, I want to pray for those of you whose faith is weak. And oftentimes, defeat makes us believe or makes us doubt, and there are lots of things that... Sh that, that sh shake our faith, but I want to pray for you that your faith would be strengthened Amen. and that you believe in creation. You believe in the cross of Christ. You believe in heaven. You believe in judgment, and you believe that God wants to ordain the steps of the righteous. Would you bow your heads at all of our campus? If you're here and you say, Pastor, I need God to strengthen my faith. My faith has been shaken. I've, I've taken a blow in my life somewhere, and I want you to pray for my faith. At all of our campuses, just lift up your hand. And let me know that you're here, and you need prayer for your faith to be shaken. I think that's a symbol of God. You're reaching up to God, saying, God, help me, help me, help me, help me. Amen. You can slip it down right now. And in just a moment after I lead people to Christ, I'm going to pray for every person here that needs prayer for faith. But if you're here and, and you say, Jonathan, I'm not right with God. I, I know that I'm not right with God because I am in sin. I'm carrying my sin. And I, do, I have no relationship with God. I have no relationship with God through Christ. But today, I would like to come to Christ and, and repent. And I would like to have access to my creator. I would like to know him. And today, that's what I'm presenting to you, is that Jesus is the way. At all of our campuses, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here and you say, Pastor, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life, and I would love to receive forgiveness of sin, would you slip up your hand and say, that's me, pray with me, and I want to do that. I want to pray with you. If you need Jesus in your life, you need to receive forgiveness of sin right now. Lift it up. Pray. Say, pray with me. Okay, okay, all right. God bless you. Okay. God bless you, man. Anybody else? Say, pray with me. Okay, right there. God bless you. Also, with your hand lifted, I want you to look at me, too, because I, I want to see your eyes. I want you to know that I, that I see you. So anybody else would say, pray with me. Okay, all right, all right. God bless you. Amen. You can slip your hands down. Church, let's all pray this prayer with those who lifted their hands as they give their hearts to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, and I believe you love me. And that's why I have the confidence to ask you into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I know I've, I've made so many mistakes. But I believe in your love. And I believe that's why you died. To take the punishment of my sin. And so I put my faith in you, Jesus. I ask you to give me access to God the Father. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. And I commit my heart to you, Jesus. I welcome you into my life. 
change everything in me. I want to be a disciple of Christ. Thank you for living in me. Amen and amen. Come on, church. Let's celebrate with those who just gave their hearts to the Lord. Oh, come on. Let's really rejoice with them. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. All right, so let's pray for faith, all right? Let's all stand and let's pray for faith. If you need your faith strengthened, then uh, let's pray. And all of you guys that that, uh, said you need your faith strengthened, would you wave at me again if you say, I need my faith strengthened? And I don't know what it is, maybe to believe for a miracle, maybe to believe God for for, uh, finances, to believe God for a breakthrough in your family. You need your faith strengthened. I want you to be bold with your faith. I want you to declare your faith out loud. And that's why confession is so powerful because it strengthens our own faith. When you say, I do believe in this. I do believe. And and so... You know, as we go into this week, I encourage you to open up your mouth and declare what you do believe. Amen. So let's let's lift our hands and receive this prayer. Father, I just pray for those who need their faith strengthened. Father, I pray that our faith would not be weak, but we would be people of strong belief. And even as Job continued to believe and was seen as righteous in your sight, God, strengthen the faith of those that are here right now. God, I pray that they're receiving the gift of faith, that they are receiving a deposit of faith in their heart. The Lord, they're being strengthened. Lord, let them believe God for great things. Lord, without faith, it's impossible to receive anything from you. So God, help, our, help us with faith. And God, I pray that we would cast doubt aside. We would cast doubt out of our lives and believe you for great things in our marriages and our families with our kids and in every area of life. God, we declare, come on, say this with me. I believe in creation. I believe in the cross of Jesus Christ. I believe that heaven is real and that I'm going there one day. I believe in the judgment of God and I believe that God directs my steps. I am a person of faith. I am a person of strong belief. I will not doubt. I will believe in the unseen. God, thank you for putting faith in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, guys. Let's give the Lord praise. All right.